things out and like uh, doing especially new things and uh, I had a uh, I do a, a few odd jobs you know I keep getting these phone calls about you know my business is eligible for a quarter million dollar loan or I just you know whatever where they keep doing these solicitations uh, for uh, you know credit cards to process to your customers and all that and I always explain so you got the wrong man I have four customers and they keep me busy enough, <laughs> and they all pay cash. So uh, it, it makes for interesting, but they, they, they do give me a few jobs here and there. And uh, recently, uh, I just had a job finished. But uh, a couple of years ago, uh, this uh, customer, she wanted a railing uh, for a house. And uh, she found out that I like to figure out how to do things that other people haven't. It was like I fixed a rocker on a 75 year old uh, uh, plantation rocker uh, and stuff like that. And, and I like doing that, you know. Uh, but anyway, she wanted this railing and uh, she showed me the picture and I had never seen it. It was a uh, Chippendale Chinese uh, design. And this is uh, some examples of the Chippendale uh, designs, you know, which just, you know, Straight lines, which I kind of like, <laughs> but Chippendale's not, he's famous for a whole lot more uh, than that. But anyway, she uh, wanted the uh, railing, and she showed me the design, and it's uh, uh, it was a, a picture of a railing on the top of a deck above. You know how they build the little deck above the carport or garage, I guess, on an attached garage, and you know, so I kind of see it. You know, so I did some research. And uh, then she said, oh, and she has a, they had their house covered over with vinyl, and I had already put a, uh, a pergola up in her backyard, uh, one of those where it has the steel beams that are sleeved with vinyl over the top and all that, you know, nice kit sort of stuff. You know, they bring the truck, offload it, you know, you get a couple of strong helpers and you just put it up. And of course, uh, she wanted it on the patio deck, but you know, some, most some of you know about building codes. So it's a freestanding. Now it only freestands about three inches away from the house, but it's freestanding and it's not attached to the house, which uh, has something to do with uh, building codes and what rules kick in uh, when you do that sort of thing. So she had like that, but it's all vinyl. So she wanted it made out of vinyl. Well, I found an instructional video on YouTube, but it was all wood, you know, but I did learn a lot uh, from the fellow who, done the, uh, who had done that uh, in wood. And of course, the thing about the vinyl is I didn't have to do the six levels of finish that he did, you know, for outdoor. Because <laughs> if you take wood and you, you, know, you put, you know, two base coats and three finish coats on top, you know, it's... That's a lot of painting. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, she wanted it in vinyl so she could pressure wash her house uh, and just hit the railings because before she'd had, this is like the third railing she'd had in there and pressure treating, pressure treated wood when hit with water, it will still rot. Uh, you know, when the pressure washer will get in there between your joints, no problem. And so that's how I wound up doing that. And that job paid for this machine you know, the uh, domino, uh, and uh, and so <clears throat> I got a domino. So then I had to figure out, well, now I got this nice machine, what else can I do with it? So I've done some uh, research and everything, and that's what we're going to go over. But what I'd first like to do is go over and, and kind of cover a little bit on uh, Thomas uh, Chippendale, who want to go ahead with the uh, presentation here. And uh, I've got a, a fairly brief uh, presentation about Thomas 
Chippendale. Now he's born in 1718, so it was a while back. And some of the work that he uh, has done has been quite amazing. And I did find this little 3D block of wood, and you can size it, and then you just type the words in, and it carves. So I can carve too. So <laughs> I can give you a picture of my carving. Anyway, Thomas Chippendale. Uh, he was actually a London cabinet maker. Now he he came up uh, in the uh, Georgian period, and they had some things like English roco roco rococo uh, and the neoclassic styles and stuff like that. And there was, if you ever talked to an interior designer, they talk about all that. Anyway, some neat carved wood, you know, with some neat styles and everything else like that. The one that we're probably most familiar with is the cabrio leg you know, with the uh, claw on the ball type uh, foot. And that was actually, he started all of that sort of stuff. Uh, but in 1754, he actually published a, a book of his uh, designs. But uh, it was during uh, King George time and uh, a lot of this style before that, there were carvings, but they were kind of flat. And what he actually brought, that he was an excellent carver, a wood carver. Now the work that they did back then is actually quite amazing considering they didn't have any CNC machines, you know, where you just program it and then it just carves it all out for you. Uh, the relief and everything, I'm sure you all have seen a lot of the, uh, that type of furniture. Uh, and of course, when you go on the internet now, I mean, back when he did it, this book that he wrote, everybody wanted to have it because obviously they didn't have the internet and all this, because he had done excellent drawings in it. And, uh, hmm? oh yeah, he decided that mahogany was the only suitable wood. Uh, uh, yeah, and you, you won't see any mahogany <laughs> in my stuff. To, you know, uh, my skills uh, need a little work. But anyway, he wrote the Gentleman and Cabinet Maker's Director, uh, which actually had these detailed designs. Now, it wasn't you know, the designs where you have your cut list and everything drawn all out nice and neat so you can actually go do it. It's actual pictures that he drew of his work, very detailed. And, and he, so in addition to being a good carver, he was an excellent artist. And then lots of people bought it back then, so then they copied it. But it took a real craftsman to copy it because you're looking at a picture and now you're trying to do it. So you got to... There is nothing on how it was assembled, how it was put together, uh, or anything. There's some interesting stuff on the internet when you kind of look underneath the dresser and how it was actually assembled. Because again, like I said, they didn't have Craig screws and they didn't have <laughs> uh, scroll saws, you know, and there was all of their detail. Uh, cutting was with a coping saw, right? And uh, to just to think back on how much work they had done like that. Uh, but he was an only child. I uh, got just an elementary education like they did back then and then went in basically apprenticeship with his father and all that. And also supposedly worked with a uh, uh, Richard Wood in York uh, before he moved to London. Now, his book was so good that Wood, who actually he had learned from, turned around and bought eight copies of his book. You know, and that was his student, if you will, uh, that he bought his book. So it was quite popular back then. Now he went ahead and got married. Uh, and interesting, now, you know, you want to do woodworking and have a business and a shop and everything. So he and his wife, Mary, uh, had five boys and four girls. So, All right, we can <laughs> get some work done. <laughs> so I'm sure those kids, you know, uh, came along and got to help. Uh, just, just like uh, mine get to help uh, when we're doing uh, work. And so he uh, rented a house uh, in Covenant and then uh, Somerset. And then in 1754, they moved to uh, St. Martin Lane in London. And that's where he actually set up his big shop. And it grew to, uh, uh, I think, around 50-some uh, employees. Uh, but he was there at that location for 60 years and operated family business uh, out of that location. Uh, in 1813, his son took over, uh, 
I mean, prior to that, his son had taken over, but in 1813, his son got evicted. You know, not that a child who takes over the parent's business runs it into the ground, but he did. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he, I guess he wasn't quite the artisan his father was, or what I don't know what all the reasons were, or uh, what all happened, but that's kind of what happened there. But in the meantime, uh, Chippendale had, had done a whole lot. Now, Chippendale really, this is some of the stuff from his book. And the, this is the, the detail of the drawings that I'm talking about. And uh, so he wasn't just a cabinet maker, okay? He also could do, you know, like this, okay? You know, everything. So uh, he had a lot of uh, big commissions, if you will. Uh, but uh, he, it says that he uh, would uh, advise also on other aspects of decor, uh, such as the soft furnishings, you know, the grapes and stuff like that, and even the color of the room on how to put it all together. So he's basically one of the first interior design firms uh, way back there in the uh, uh, late 17, early 1800s. Uh, but they could actually work as an interior design uh, company, work with other specialists, uh, and actually do whole houses, you know, once the base construction was done, then they would come in and, you know, do all the carving around the, the window frames and uh, make the furniture. I mean, just the whole deal. Uh, and supposedly they have actually documented uh, 26 large-scale commissions that their company had for aristocrats of the day. You know, go where the money is, right? And like they say, well, what kind of work do you do? whatever the customer's paying for. And <laughs> so I think that uh, he probably figured that out real well and uh, was real successful. And uh, anyway, he did have a real good eye for design and technique. Uh, his workshop uh, was probably one of the most uh, successful uh, back then. And like I said, his, his book was quite uh, popular. Uh, This is some uh, reproductions and a couple of original. This is actually an original piece here, this bookcase uh, that Chippendale's firm did. Uh, but it's, it's just beautiful work. <clears throat> and he worked in, in lots of different areas, you know, but the detail that they did uh, and, and, you know, just the uh, wonderful work. Uh, the one up there in the top left is a reproduction of uh, one of the desks, you know, where folks uh, like we do, we say, oh, that English, I wonder if I could build that, you know, so uh, my skill level's got to go some before I tackle anything like any of those in, in that uh, display there, those four uh, pictures. And that's just a few. I mean, when you do a search for images on Google for Chippendale design, it just pages and pages and pages of, of images. So you can access and find out Everything, even down to details where they get, you know, a picture of just the uh, cabrio uh, foot on how the detail of, of uh, doing that sort of stuff. So, you know, even though there's no assembly instructions or joinery instructions or anything else like that, uh, a whole uh, lot of information out there. But uh, he in influenced, and then, of course, his book uh, got brought over here to the U.S., and he just was a huge influence on uh, designs uh, throughout. And like I said, uh, he did uh, a period, you know, he started with uh, King George type design what we could, and then added the more detailed, more depth carving to a lot of that and then some of his own designs. Did the book, but he also did the Rococo uh, Chippendale designs, you know, which is a lot of the uh, really or ornate uh, type of stuff. And, uh, Let's see, but uh, his uh, carving abilities lightened up and lifted the uh, what they called ponderous George the First designs. You know, <laughs> it was big, massive furniture and all this was uh, kind of lightened things up. Uh, and of course, uh, working with the ball and clawfoot, and uh, the uh, in the, the Rococo is in the French court. Uh, you know, so you know he he was nonpartisan. You know. He'd work for the English or he'd work for the French, you know, it didn't matter. 
And, uh, you know, like I said, whatever the customer will pay for. Uh, but in the uh, French court of Louis the XV, uh, was kind of a buzz for the elegance of the Rococo design. And that's what uh, this was here, uh, with some of the more ornate uh, sort of things. So, you know, both courts in England and in uh, France, you know, he, whatever you'll pay for, I can do that. <laughs> And uh, so he's quite prolific. The other was a uh, more gothic Chippendale. Uh, so in this period, uh, you know, you know, we're probably most familiar with that in, in the gothic churches, uh, but they also did that in furniture. Now, I don't know that this did as well as say the um, you know change to the uh, George uh, the first designs or the Rococo, but you know because it was rather dark and, you know, jarring to me sometimes. You know, I don't know, know that very many people would sit in a chair like this. It might look pretty in the corner, but I don't know that uh, how, how much of that they actually uh, uh, did. But anyway, from the churches, it found its way into chair backs and other carved uh, fine wood. Now, he was, uh, his, his designs were real flexible. In other words, it wasn't that this is what we're going to do. In other words, he would work with his customers and, you know, you'd have this basis on it. Of course, back then, the aristocrats had lots of money, so they could have all the extremely detailed work and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, somebody with less money, well, okay, we don't need all of that fine fret work in the legs of the chair and all this carving and all that. So you just put a little top piece on the chair and roll it out the door. Uh, so some of them are, uh, some designs are, are more flexible. Uh, now, he liked mahogany, but you know others, uh, and also when you're working with somebody who maybe isn't an aristocrat, uh, it turns out that the, uh, what they call English deal, which we would call yellow pine, uh, but it's uh, pine and uh, oak were used rather than mahogany because you know, more readily available, cheaper wood, uh, and that sort of thing. So you can still get designs, you know, just not so uh, much. But uh, like I say, you could have a plain leg on the chair instead of all the fine fret work, you know, designed in there. So if you change the wood from mahogany to uh, pine and then don't do the fret work on the legs and just have a square leg, you cut out a whole lot of cost on that chair. Uh, so it, it was, you know, again, what is the customer you know, willing to pay for, and they would just uh, do the work. Uh, anyway, he uh, uh, did do a, a, a great deal of uh, contribution to design. Now, one of those was the Chinese design, okay? And that was, uh, like I said, uh, it's an architecture. And it, it, it was, Specifically, it did a lot of work on the uh, railing designs. Uh, the, the one that you may find for me, uh, familiar is uh, <clears throat> is that he actually did, uh, uh, I mean, an example of that here in the United States uh, is the uh, <clears throat> wing terraces and the uppermost uh, balustrade at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. And of course, you know, being a good politician, you know, he was using other people's money. So, <laughs> back to that. but anyway, that is an example of the Chinese style was actually on the uh, uh, Monticello. And there was there's one section that's a, a railing. Yeah, they would do that to, I guess, covering up the, the peak of the roof or something. It, it looked pretty. There wasn't a deck up there, it was just a railing on top of the roof. And, uh, but it looks pretty. So uh, that, that is probably one of the more famous uh, ones of the Chinese uh, design. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, they call it just Chinese Chippendale. And so he in incorporated that into a whole lot of different things. And these are just some different uh, examples of designs. In other words, uh, the one on the top right, in other words, these are set up for actual uh, uh, porch railings. You know, they're 40, seven three quarters almost 48 inches for fastening and then I think 29 inches of height which then allows 
you to have the space below and the, and the rail on top, and so you get a, a 30 to 36 inch height rail. <clears throat> but these, these are just uh, drawings uh, that I pulled off. <clears throat> now the uh, these are some examples of some actual rails. <clears throat> the one on the top right is the one I was talking about at Monticello. That's on the top of the uh, roof there at uh, Jefferson's uh, <clears throat> Monticello. Uh, but, you know, more uh, normal type, you know, like in the bottom left there is a uh, 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 porch rail, which is like the, the job that I did uh, with a different uh, design, but the same concept. <clears throat> now, I, I did use uh, a lot of prefabbed uh, sleeves that go over four by four posts, you know, uh, again, it's vinyl sleeves. And then we had uh, a railing that uh, we purchased that just goes together. So all you got to provide is the piece in the middle and then cut it and it used blind fasteners. So it uh, looked real nice when we were done. But the designs are all <coughs> uh, flexible. Now there's the one at the top left, you could square it up more, but see they've stretched it out on the design so that it gives an elongated uh, look to the uh, railing. And of course they use several different uh, patterns in that railing. Uh, I wouldn't mind bidding on a job like that, but uh, especially the deck boards, they look like uh, teak. <laughs> uh, yeah. Back then, how did they fasten? Hmm? Back then, how did they fasten? Yeah. And, you know, tenons. <laughs> <laughs> You know, with hand saws and chisels and all hand tools, uh, which it fascinates me how they accomplished things back then. Uh, I mean, I, I uh, refurbed, uh, I've done a couple of old tools and I refurbed a, uh, a plane for making the uh, mullions for, for windows. And <clears throat> after I fixed it and, and sharpened it and made it work, and then I made a strip about this long, right? took a while and trying to figure out how do you hold the piece so you can run the plane across it and get it consistent and then you got to flip it over and do the other side you know so that, and so some you know apprentice or journeyman sat you know, went outside on site uh, I, I bid on a uh, old uh, home that was built years ago but it was a 17 story house and had cedar beams underneath it and it somebody else got a bid but it's 17 rooms but to imagine that they built that stick truly stick by stick including the windows <clears throat> and then some apprentice sat there all day long you know planing by hand <laughs> every single one of the mullions you know to assemble those uh, windows because they didn't come prefabbed on a truck you know you actually had lumber and cut it and then uh, fix it all and so after I did that little piece and all that then that in the plane went up on display and <laughs> uh, And then when I really need to do it, you know router zoom, <laughs> And I'm done <laughs> so To to see what they accomplished back then uh, and the detail of their styles and everything is just absolutely amazing I mean if you get a chance to go out and look at some especially the chairs and the carving and the fretwork that they did on some of those. I mean, the legs that had uh, coping saw fretwork. And, and we're talking about a leg, you know, that's like two inches thick, and they're, and it's beautiful stuff. Uh, <clears throat> of course, these days, I, I doubt that, uh, I guess there's a lot of stuff that we've kind of gotten away from grace and elegance, uh, because it does take time, and, and people don't want, even with the tools we have, it does take some time to do that. Now, <clears throat> here's some more advanced and elaborate uh, designs. Uh, a nice little bridge there, you know, outdoor uh, bridge. And it's outdoor furniture and stuff like that that I'm actually trying to get into and, and actually do. I uh, just like working with it. <clears throat> uh, I don't think I'll ever have a go at a ra railing. Uh, uh, stair rail like that. Uh, that's just not going to happen. Uh, I've got a birthday coming up. I'll be 70, so I don't even have time to learn. <laughs> uh. 
Not that I wouldn't want to, and you know, now if a customer came along <coughs> and they were going to pay $100 a foot for that as they did for the railing that I did do for out exterior, yeah, I might be <laughs> convinced to have a go at it. But uh, this on the bottom right is more like what I'm looking to do. And I have, uh, I'm working on a real good lead source. Uh, it's the crew that installs decks for Lowe's and so since they build them a nice big fancy deck I'm sure they need some furniture so I'm trying to develop that as a lead source because the guy lives right next door to me uh, but that's just some designs in that uh, unusual fence designer that's their fence and they made these huge you know uh, I guess it's about seven and a half feet, eight feet tall uh, fence. I mean, now that's some joinery there to get that, uh, this one on the, on the right here. The joinery to take, I mean, these look about like a two by four. <laughs> and to get all of that together and, and to hold, you know, so uh, uh, now if I was doing that, I'd probably use the uh, largest tenons that I have, but then I'd also pin it, you know, so, uh, Mortise I had tenons and then uh, the dominoes and then drill holes and and you know drive pins into it. Um, so you know, that's, that's just my choice and everything else like that. So we've got all these wonderful uh, designs and everything. Now here's a couple other examples. Oops, wrong arrow. Uh, <coughs> is a four panel bench up there and then an outdoor planter and all that and uh, the uh, planter is kind of what this design is from now I've I felt like since we got Halloween coming up why not <laughs> so uh, I may make a planter my wife says you know she saw what I was doing and she says oh well are you going to make the whole planter you know because I've got the other two panels I said well I guess I could and of course now since it's orange, I guess I got a time schedule uh, to meet, you know, like in two days, <laughs> finish putting this together. But I, I just thought, and also being able to, you know, uh, show it off there, uh, the color contrast and everything. But I got the idea for that from this uh, picture here on the outdoor planner. It was uh, a planner like that. And see, she saw that picture, right? She didn't see what's in the shop. So to go from here to here is still a little bit of work but I may just use this kind of fastening in the corners that I'm using for the display now it wasn't the uh, Chinese design wasn't just outdoors or uh, stuff like that we saw the railing but also indoors so here's a, uh, a cabinet with the Chinese Chippendale on top of mirrors on the uh, uh, doors of the cabinet uh, there's a uh, some shelves where the back and the sides uh, is actually using the Chippendale design, and then of course a chair <coughs> uh, that's uh, using that design, and then another uh, thing. And like I said, you can go online and just find you know millions and millions of copies of all kinds of different things uh, that not only uh, Chippendale did and it, it, and his uh, the immediate people that came, but also like I said, it's, it's been copied. Uh, years and years and years and uh, woodworkers o over you know was that over two three hundred years i uh, have uh, been uh, copying his uh work so it, it was quite prolific and quite impactful on uh, design and like i said other things here like here's a glass table where the uh under uh, piece has the chinese chippendale underneath uh we've got some wall art there you know in, in over the headboard uh, the mirror style wise is out of place but <laughs> you know that, that was more back in the earliest uh, time in the uh, King George uh, time but they also did mirrors and they uh, have uh, did, did a lot of different ones but over time people want different things so if you're doing Chinese designs uh, and also even jewelry you know where uh, his designs and everything uh, were taken from woodworking and moved into metal and ceramics and 
uh, pottery and all kinds of things, you know, that his designs have been incorporated in. So there's really no limit, so it's, it's kind of like, what do you want to do? Uh, yes, sir. To cut, you know, to fret work. Fret work exactly. Yeah. What, what were the thoughts there? What, what would, uh, what for, would be the factors to make for, for me, this is my factor. The size of my smallest domino, okay. <laughs> which is four millimeters. So if I, which is the level that I'm actually working at, uh, which I'll, I'll get into in a little bit, but it's a one inch. Uh, piece so I can go down. I could probably do three quarters uh, and still use this, but that'd be pretty close on the edges. But uh, it's one inch wide by three quarters inch uh, thick uh, work that I can do with the domino. You know, now y you could use uh, you know other other types of uh, joinery. I mean, we've seen the really really small uh, boxes, right, with uh, small uh, joinery. So it's it's up to your skill level. But using the machine, um, this is the smallest level I've worked at, is a one inch by three quarter uh, inch uh, fretwork. So. But as you see, well, like the uh, piece you did there, I mean, once you get into using a scroll saw, I mean, you could get, you know, really small. Uh, that jewelry was, um, yeah, it's soldered, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's soldered. Uh, so we just. <laughs> I'm thinking, why not just cast it? <laughs> but then, you know, to cast it, you need a furnace and a few other things like that. You know, that table, the table, the glass table is kind of, you'd think they would have had some of that design in that square on the legs. In the legs, yeah. Well, and you could. You know, that was the whole thing about chimney. You know, it was flexible and all that sort of stuff. So uh, it would depend upon uh, what you, what the rest of the room looked like. I and mean, that was what chimney was into also is not just the piece he was doing, but how did it fit in to the room or into the house or in, into whatever the environment that it's been placed in. Oops, wrong button. And then here's some different examples chairs. of chairs. A uh, whole set of dining chairs up there and uh, yeah. the one on the bottom up right there. <coughs> and then, uh, you know, just thinking about the work that went into this chair, you know, with the carving and the fretwork and all that went in. <laughs> yeah, my picture got cut off on the top there. That chair is, is similar to those on okay. the top left. It has a top on it like that, you know, uh, which is kind of the Chinese style with the, the little carving at the top was actually the earlier style uh, they did where he combined them together, uh, you know, which uh, is kind of neat. So. <laughs> when, yeah, this is where I'll start. So when you will get to now uh, some of the stuff about how do you do that, okay? And again, they work with hand tools and all that. We have power tools. And, uh, and I know that we have the period furniture group that uh, meets down the road and all that. And they're all, you know, about, but I do know that, for example, like uh, the, uh, the router work, when it uh, comes up time to do a whole lot of work, like talk about mullions and stuff like that, they have been known to use a power tool. Because <laughs> I've done that, you know, trying to make a piece, you know, and, and it's hours to do what I can do in like 10 minutes on the router. And uh, so it, it is quite amazing. But the first thing you should do is lay it out, okay? Now, this is actually the design, the basic design that I uh, built the rail, railing for the uh, uh, lady out of vinyl. And so you had to figure out the placement. Now there's some math involved. Now, on her railing, since you know, you've got a building code, so the distance between any two pieces of, of, of wood or vinyl, whatever, it has to be four inches or less. You know, so a kid can't stick their head through it. And uh, <clears throat> so this one happens to be three and a half inches in that spacing between them. The one I did was a, just 
short of uh, four inches because I was doing uh, metric. So it was a hundred, uh, uh, I mean 25, uh, is that right? A hundred millimeters, you know, which is just short of four inches uh, in, in diameter. And the reason I did millimeters is German built millimeters. <laughs> And the, you know I could set the stops real easy and and then just uh, work it real out. So the thing is, is when you you got this laid out. Now when you assemble this, you got some issues because parts of this have to be done first. So you would do like these two pieces, and then these two, and put them together, and then these two, and those two, and then put that. So not only do you have to lay out your design, but you need to work out your assembly. Uh, uh, sequence that you're going to be doing on it uh, using Morris tenons. Now, with railings, this red X, that you know, if you've got a specific height you have to do, and certain you know, in other words, the parameters that, of what you're fitting in there, then this determines this. There's some fancy math that you can do if you want to, or you could do like I do, lay it out, figure, oh, well, that didn't, and then go cut another, you know, quarter inch off and then <laughs> and, and get it till it fits, all right? Uh, but that is, is critical, in other words, if you want this to come out exactly. Now, when they did this wrong, they uh, kind of messed up because, I, I, like I said, I've done that. You see, <clears throat> This point, you can't fasten that. It's not going to fasten. And so my design, this is actually extended down to here. Okay, in other words, this piece extends past. In other words, it doesn't go to here. All right? So that I actually have, and the same thing up at this end here, uh, so that I actually have something to fasten to. Uh, other than that, they did all right in, in presenting the concept and the idea that they're trying to uh, talk about. Now here's a, a different design, okay? It's still the same thing, it's just that we changed how uh, we put all the pieces together. Uh, and you'll see this a lot out there on uh, porch railings and all that. It's, it's fairly simple to do. Uh, the assembly is certainly a lot simpler than the previous design. <coughs> now, if you don't want to do all the work, there are companies like this one who will sell you prefab panels <laughs> that you just stick in, you know, for a price, of course. You know, you being the customer now, well, how much are you going to pay? And uh, now, in some cases, you may want to buy it, right? Uh, rather than try to figure out how to do it. And then, of course, we have, you know, the mahogany, you know, and you can get real complicated, okay, and uh, in the work. Now, I'm not ready to tackle this. There are a few joints, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, right there. <laughs> so, it, there's, you know, to do this and to do really nice work, it, it takes some uh, doing. But, you know, one day, you know, that, that's my goal one day. And I might actually try to do it in mahogany. But there will be two or three prototypes first. <laughs> so, how do we do it? All right, well, that's the end of the presentation. I thank you. Thank you.